So purpose of testing, there's really two kinds of testing. There's design verification testing and then there's production testing. In design verification testing, you're actually testing the design. So you're using a prototype as an embodiment of a design. And because we know that that prototype can never be any better than the quality of the design, you know that if, if your prototype meets the requirements, then sure, certainly the design is, uh, meets the requirements. There are some issues around manufacturability and ease of assembly that won't always come out of prototype testing. But if you're saying, you know, yes, this, this prototype of a car will go 200 miles an hour, if your rough prototype does it, then probably the design is good. Okay, so you typically test small numbers. You just want to know that the design, that the design fundamentally works. And then there's production testing. And production testing is about making sure that you know, a million units in a row all meet the same specs and all meet that design intent. And that one unit after another on the assembly line are just like each other. So that, you know, somebody can buy two widgets in a row and won't see a difference. And that they'll be reliable and, and do what's expected. So they're really two fundamentally different challenges. Okay, when you test, you test under uh, a number of different conditions. There's normal use and that's pretty obvious. Does, does the vacuum cleaner vacuum? Uh, abnormal use, uh, will it vacuum up nuts and bolts? There's abuse, I get mad and throw it down the stairs. What happens then? And, and then life and reliability, so which is you know, pretty obvious. Will it run long enough that my uh, warranty return rate is low enough? And incidentally, for consumer products, you almost never have to think about product life in general. That if, you get, if your warranty failure rate is below something like 0.4%, the product life is so long that the consumer will get sick of it and throw it away before it ever wears out. Now, well, obviously, there's some exceptions, like if you build a, a ferries for the Hong Kong uh, you know, ferry authority, those suckers were at least 50 years old. The one last one I was on was laid down in 1953, and I'm sure the warranty on those things is like one day after you receive it. So uh, uh, that's the unobvious exception, but consumer products are different. Okay, and the reason you have to test for all these uh, categories is, you know, consider for example, uh, you manufacture a woodworking chisel, right? and you're going to sell this in Home Depot, where all, all manner of chuckleheads are going to buy it. You know, it's got a performance normal use, but it's probably not going to be all that great at it because you're selling this chisel pretty cheaply. Um, but it's got to be sharp enough to pair wood. That is abnormal use, so, so I used to probably open a paint can. And the guys who buy a woodworking chisel from Home Depot are probably going to open a lot of paint cans with that chisel. And if you had made it out of a really hard steel that held a really great edge, and, but unfortunately it was kind of brittle, and if I'm prying that paint can off and, and a t piece of the tip snaps off and hits me in the eye, that's pretty bad because you it's unreasonable to expect that the guy who buys it at Home Depot won't open cans of paint with it. If you sell, if you make a woodworking chisel that sells for 50 bucks and you sell it through the really fancy woodworking supply places where only, you know, uh, uh, trained and experienced cabinet makers will bother spending that kind of money for it, they're probably not going to open cans of paint with their $50 chisel. So you can make it out of much better steel that holds a much better edge. Now, abuse, I decide I'm going to cut a nail with that chisel. What happens when I do that? You know, I better not hurt myself because, again, the guy from Home Depot is probably going to do stuff like that. And then life and reliability is pretty obvious. How many times do I have to hit on the handle with a hammer before it splits? Okay, types of test data. There are two types of data, attribute data and variable data. And attribute data is like pass, fail, go, no, go. And variable data is the actual measured quantity. And this may seem like a trivial distinction, but it's, it's actually pretty important. Let's imagine you build hydraulic pumps and General Dynamics has bought a thousand of them to put into submarines and the spec for the pump says it shall deliver 3,000 plus minus 100 PSI. So you have a test fixture on your production line and plug the pump into it and there's a red light bulb and a green light bulb. And if it's within, if it's between 2,900 and 3,100 you get the green light bulb if it's outside you get red. And so you run your production lot through it and they're all green. So you, you ship them, you're good. Consider a, a, another occurrence where instead in addition to go, no, go, you actually uh, can measure and record the actual pressure produced. And let's say all of them are in the low 2900s, 2905, 2920, 2902, the whole lot. You know, what's that tell you and, and would you take any action because of that? That's yes, we don't know the design, we don't know the, what's happening, but yeah, you're on the low end of your range. Right. So you probably need to do something to be in the middle. Right. And just imagine if you're the calibration of your gauge and General Dynamics incoming QC gauge is a little bit different. You, the whole lot might flunk. Or the tools just have to wear a little bit more, and then all of a sudden you can't produce them to spec anymore. So that's what, and you can always convert this to this. You can always take the numbers and calculate the go, no go. So always collect the variable data if you ever have a choice and store it. 
Okay, test coverage. Um, in general, 100% testing is uh, always best if, you, if it can be done. Uh, certainly, if you're making consumer goods, you got to do it because you just never get a chance to get the production line running at a, a, a stable enough point that you can uh, do uh, testing on a sample basis. And the manufacturers that do contract manufacturing of uh, consumer goods don't have the, the t tools or the know-how to set up those kinds of lines anyways. I'm sorry, they, uh, the manufacturers of which kind of products don't have the... Uh, consumer products. So like, if you go into a Walmart Target and you're looking at their, their middle of the line consumer electronics, those are or are not tested? Everything's, pretty much everything you see in a Walmart would be 100% test. Wow, that's impressive. They pretty, you pretty much have to, yeah. because it comes right down to the, the, rely, the, in order to achieve a low return rate, your failure rate has to be so absurdly low, you can't get there without that kind of test program. The other secret is, the cheapest vacuum at Walmart probably gets just as many tests as the most expensive one. It's all, the difference is just a matter of design. Okay, sometimes you can only do a sample. Destructive testing, obviously. Um, test 100% of your production line, you're not gonna make much money. Uh, some tests are too expensive, some are too slow. Life testing is all three of those, typically. So things like life tests, you know, life tests, drop tests, high pot tests, over temp, under temp, you know, et cetera. Uh, all, the, all those are done on a sample basis. And you can construct a sample test plan uh, that will give you a certain level of statistical confidence. The MilSpec 105 uh, uh, sampling procedure at normal inspection level two typically gives you an 80% level of confidence. So depending on how much of your, what fraction of your sample you're willing to expend, you can have any level of confidence you desire. Um, one of the things uh, uh, that's kind of funny, first trip to China I ever took to a Chinese factory, uh, we're having a meeting about some quality problem and I asked the quality engineer how we chose the sample size and test standards for this test he ran. And so here we have this, this uh, uh, a Chinese engineer who's grown up in the Communist People's Republic of China he whips out a fifth generation photocopy of the United States Department of Defense Mill Standard, Standard 105E and flips it open and starts referring to charts and tables. I thought that was absolutely hysterical. Okay, uh, component life test in the reading line. You remember we did that example failure budget of the vacuum cleaner where you know the, you had the one motor at 0.1 percent, another one at 0.15 percent. Um, so you set up this budget now you might then take, as we did at iRobot, 50 of the suction motor, 50 of the agitator motor, and you build a fixture that simulates the load you think it's going to see because the product doesn't exist yet, and you test them. And you see what the actual failure rate is and determine whether it met your spec or not. And if it didn't, then you redesign, you, you make changes to the motors, we did. We took standard motors from uh, folks like Mabuchi, and we did testing, and we found the output bearing couldn't, wouldn't stand up. So we had them put a special bearing in. We found that the brushes were, were damaged from vibration that traveled down the shaft. So we put in special brushes, changed the spring constant. And so we made 15 cents worth of changes to the motor that took the life from, say, 200 hours to 4,000 hours. And we could only do this because we were able to quickly go through three, four, five generations of testing and, uh, and, and get 4,000 hours out of, life, of life out of what is now a 65-cent toy motor. Okay. Um, another important point, uh, testing's got to be realistic. You know, you get a guy who says, okay, I'm, I've got a, a motor that's, that's a part of a wheel module that drives a orbit around, and he just sticks it on a bench and spins it, you know, in the free air, and it runs 4,000 hours. So he says, ah, that's good. It has no load on it. And so, he's, so he adds a fan blade, which is a common way to load a motor, put a fan blade on it. And so he loads it up to the proper torque and current, and now it runs, still runs 4,000. He thinks he's good. Hasn't got any vibration from a gear train. There's no shock loading from when the robot hits a wall. Uh, no other sources of vibration. So it's, it's not realistic. So you have to keep adding, you have to as much as possible make the test as realistic as possible so that it represents what the motor is actually going to see in, in, uh, in real life. The other thing is what happens internally when you have a failure on the scuba, the, um, and you, you'll know who the person I'm talking about is, so, so don't mention the name. Uh, there are the, the drive modules for the scuba. Uh, we set up this fixture on them, so as soon as the engineer had prototypes built, we slapped them right on the fixture start testing. And this is uh, a, an assembly that I think was supposed to live 3,200 hours. Fails at 110. And plastic case was fracturing the part of the case that supported the output bearing of the gear. Gearbox is fracturing. And the engineer is arguing it does fluke, your test fixture is unrealistic, and blah, 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 blah. And so, you know, we really dug our heels in and we had kind of a, a little pissing contest over it. Finally, he added a couple of ribs to support the output bearing, and, but they weren't enough. 
and we told him that, but he was being stubborn. So we tested it, ran 140 hours and failed. At this point, he's really getting stubborn, so this is completely unrealistic. We finally had the first prototype full scuba run, ran that in a pen, it last, the, 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 the drive module lasted 110 hours and failed. And at that point, he shut up and just redesigned it until, it until it met the requirements. So the important rule is there's essentially no such thing as a fluke. There, there, you know, maybe if a meteor hits the factory, I'll, I'll, I'll admit that's a fluke, but I might ask you for data on the frequency of meteor impacts. And you, know, you, you could argue the fixture is um, unrealistic, but you know, in all the years of testing I've done, I've ne never actually had it happen that the fixture was uh, too strict. It's always been the other way. I've always wished I'd made it harder. Okay, and the, the product has got to be considered guilty until proven innocent. So you don't have to prove to the engineer that his, uh, his, his, his design is bad. He has to prove to you that it's good. Okay, uh, system life testing. You can test all the subassemblies until they're great. Uh, it doesn't mean the system will perform. There are going to be failures that are, that are a cooperative effort between all the different components, and it's not apparent until you put everything together. Uh, this happens a lot in software. It also happens a lot with electronics, especially with electrical noise problems. Um, there's also a, a matter of economics. You get the modules to the point where they're just not failing. And you're running the tests and just weeks and months are going by with no failures. And if there's no failures, you're not learning anything. And because it's all about to maximize the rate at which you're learning about the products, so you can make the changes. You can't make a design improvement until you know what the defect is. So you put the stuff together in a system and then the failure rates start cranking up again. And that's good because it means you're, you're finding things that can be fixed and, and improve the product. Okay, as I mentioned before, one of the key things here is maximize the rate of learning. That's really during development. The f and I, when I went to work for a company called PRI Automation, uh, my boss, the VP of engineer there, a guy named uh, Mort, uh, not Mort, uh, gosh, what was Mitch's last name? Anyways, I'll think of it in a moment. And uh, uh, he said, your job is to maximize the learning. D-information, D-T, D-time, is what I want. And the way I put it to the guys who worked for me was, we have to break stuff faster than the engineering team can fix it. It's like the two hunters attacked by a bear, and the one guy puts on his running shoes, and the other hunter says, you can't outrun a bear even with running shoes. He says, I don't have to outrun the bear. I have to outrun you. And that was the key thing. We've got to stay ahead of the engineering department. As long as we can break stuff faster than they can fix it, then the organization is making progress forward at maximum rate. And so it's all about the rate of learning. It's not about proving that the product's good. Because when you build a new design, what are the chances it meets the life spec right from the beginning? Zero, zero right. So you, know, you don't have to measure it. You know it's zero. So uh, just go ahead and find out what needs to be fixed. And that, that works in cooperation with that other rule earlier, which is any test you can afford to do should have zero failures. So this works out to be, you know, test it determine the failures, fix everything. And then you've got a, a shot at building a good product. And that's it.